Hello, everyone. Um, it's the end of the day, so I'll try to be brief. I'm sure you must be sensing some uh, architectural fatigue. Um, working on this project is, or talking about this project more like, is something that uh, I'm always grateful to do because it's one of those projects that defines you. Uh, I know every architect had a few like this. This is very not typical of what we did. It's a project that uh, took almost 10 years to build. It's not very big. Um, it's in a place that's a little bit remote. But uh, in doing it, it changed our way of um, understanding and making architecture. So I'll try to talk about three very simple ideas while I talk about this. Um, this we were always fascinated by the notion that um, an element in the landscape can define what's around it. Um, I showed before the Robert Smithson spiral. This is a, um, uh, a structure that you see in the south of Morocco in the Atlas Mountain. They're um, just walls. This is actually one of the most ornate ones. And it's, it just sits there. And sometimes it's uh, in a plain, sometimes it's in a mountain. You don't really know what it's there for. It's called a msla. Uh, there's just a wall, a hole, and, and three steps. And it's something that's used only once a year. And once a year, it looks like this. It's used as an outdoor uh, prayer place. But the rest of the time, it's just like this. And the memory of that particular moment when it's used is enough to define the landscape. And we work a lot with this notion of memory. Uh, we consider that architecture is a form of trigger uh, of memory and sensorial experiences. And the line, as it is, in its presence in the landscape, it's something fascinating uh, to us because it's the disappearance of one of the three dimensions of architecture. When something gets so thin or something gets so long or something gets so high that uh, the third dimension disappears, it starts to become more of a landscape presence than an inhabitable one. Uh, the tectonic starts to disappear. The project I'm going to talk about is set in a, in a Roman outpost. Um, if you were naughty in the Roman Empire, they would send you here. This is the most western part of the Roman Empire. And as a rule, I like to think that um, if the Romans went somewhere, it's for a good reason. They were amazing about choosing the places. Um, and Volubilis is amazing in the sense that it's exactly the way it was 2,000 years ago. Nothing was built around it. You still see the plan of the Zarhon in the same way. It's still uh, the vignes, uh, du blé, uh, cypresses, alignments. It's incredible. The patrimony of Volubilis isn't just the city, it's a landscape it sits in. And when we started working on this project 10 years ago, um, we had a partner in crime, which was our minister of culture at the time. I know architects like to not say good things about their client. I'm going to say a lot of very good things about this one because it was a complicated project. Nobody wanted it to happen. Um, UNESCO, which protects this site, forbid us from doing anything. So we designed this very, we thought, gentle and simple project. And a year and a half into the design process, uh, UNESCO threatened to uh, declassify the site as a protected uh, world heritage. And I don't know what happened in the, our minister's mind, but it triggered a very strong anti-colonial feel. So he came to me on Friday, he took a plane, came to our office in Paris and was like, we have to do something. What can we do? We meet with them on Tuesday. We have to convince them. The reason why they didn't want us to do the project, it's because there were some small structures um, inside the, the site. And these structures were built by the French in the early 20s. They're not spectacular. They're, they were there. But the dogma of the patrimony is that if it's there, you don't touch it. The problem is that, and I don't have a pointer, but this is the entire perimeter of the site. And as you can see, the Roman uh, built the city only on the western part of, it, of the valley. There's a valley in the middle. On the eastern part of the valley, nothing was built. The reason for that is that the, the, the earth isn't stable. Obviously, the French, not being as smart as the Romans, built there, and the few structures that were built were actually ruined, impossible to use. And there were these very small structures, which were um, the housing for the conservateur, um, small labs, area of storage, but not extremely important. They were very quaint and elegant. The problem, though, is that they were sitting on top of the site. And um, for people who like uh, geotechnical issues, you can see by looking at the corners of window that it looks like they went through an earthquake, right? Like the land isn't stable. 
So they're starting to become dangerous. And we can't demolish them, and we don't have the money to build somewhere else. So all we have to do is to rehabilitate them, which we didn't have the money to do. So on Friday, we decided um, to demolish them without telling anybody overnight, over the weekend, before our meeting on Tuesday. I paid with my own dime, and I, we hired a, a small contractor with the, the Pelteuse, and we tore it down. And we did the meeting on site instead of in Rabat. And we were like, okay, so what do we do now? It's not there anymore. Bite me. Um, they were not happy, but uh, 10 years into it, they're using this project as a, an example of intervention in archaeological sites. I've been touring the world talking about UNESCO and saying how great they are in helping us doing this. But uh, I'd just like to remind them of that from time to time. I don't know. It's my spiteful side. Um, this project is interesting to us because the relationship to the patrimoine, to what's there, was twofold. One, it had to do with the Romans. Two, it had to do with the, the French. And you couldn't ignore one to deal with the other. So the French was very quickly dealt with. We took it out. It wasn't... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very involved in the patrimoine récent, and we do a lot of rehabilitation, and we're very activists in that, but it's not because it's there that it has to stay. And there is no way around it, and there's also a strong statement in saying there hasn't been a single museum built in Morocco before that since the independence. So there was a political statement saying, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this our way. It, the interesting part is that um, the Minister of Culture at the time was born about five kilometers away from here, in Moulay Dres Sarhon. So he knew all of the cranes and areas of the site. And when we um, went to look for the best place to, to build, uh, we used him a lot, actually, because uh, he had some very interesting uh, histories and memories of the site. So the building isn't a building. It's really a parcours. It's a trajectory. It's 300 meters long and six meters wide. Um, and what we did first is we stabilized the uh, the hill, because we didn't want to have the same problem as the colonial building, so we built a dam, a big concrete dam. Because when you see a sunken building, it looks very gentle and nice, but it's actually extremely violent, because you have to take the hill, move it out, put the building, and put the hill back. So it's, it's a very scarring uh, process. is isn't something very gentle. And we had to go through that, and obviously when you start digging, then you find lots of things, so it stops again for a few years and so on and so forth. But the interesting part is that when we were faced with this notion of how do we create a relationship to the Romans, or to the Roman ruins, obviously it wasn't going to be one of mimics. So what essentially we did is inscribe the disappearance of the building in its materiality. We used three materials and three materials only, concrete, wood, and the stone. The stone is quarried uh, in volubilis. The wood is used in the cedar, or not cedar, the, uh, yes, it seems said, in the cedar forest near Meknes, and the concrete is a Roman element. And these three elements have different duration. So we were planning the moment where this building becomes a ruin in the landscape. First goes the wood, then goes the stone, and then goes the concrete. And in the end, it stays this long infrastructural presence. Um, the building has an interesting program where to the, to the right for you is the public area with the museum and all the visitor area, the bathrooms, the cafe and so on. And all the other side is the, um, the part where the public can't go. Uh, it's the research area, the, the labs, the, the housing for the archaeologues. And these two things had to sit in the, in the same place. So what we did is very simple. We took as a dogma that the highest point of the project should be lower than the lowest point of the site. Meaning, when you came back, when you entered, you would get to see La Plaine du Zerron the way it was, which wasn't the case, because before you had to go through this small labyrinth of colonial buildings. So it's first a roof, and then it's a cave, and then you emerge from it. So the building is both sunken and suspended, as you will see, and it's extremely simple. I mean, um, I talk often about uh, how we approach this. Um, you know, we're all uh, worried about building a lot and building quickly, and we all have 30 projects in the office, and we like things to go quickly. This is an example where um, doing it slowly works. I don't know if we can coin the, the term um, slow architecture, like slow food, where it actually take, took time. It took time in everything, because the contractor was a very small contractor from there who didn't know how to build in concrete. So we did uh, almost cooking with him uh, to reinvent a form of... Um, Heroic concrete. Uh, Morocco has a longer history of um, uh, 
du bédon héroïque. This, uh, not, not Peter Zumthor's concrete, but something with, the, with acne, with thickness that catches the light. Um, and I'll show you very quickly how we did that. So this is the building in elevation, which obviously you'll never see like this. Uh, you enter in the moment where it's the shallowest. And then on the one side, the, the public area, where it goes under the museum into the site and back into the museum. And on the other side, the, the areas for the researchers. That's what you see when you arrive. So the, the building becomes just this canopy uh, that's covered. We had no money at all. When, and I'm not saying this because I want you to feel sorry for me, but um, it was very complicated. I know sometimes we say that we turn these complicated things into an advantage. That's just a big sack of BS. It's very complicated not to have money to build. So we did something here which um, we regretted after that because it took two years. But in order to build the concrete like this, we had to choose either concrete or wood for the facade. So we, we bought very expensive wood, the cedar, and we used it to build the formwork for the concrete. And then we took it out and we, on la poncé, how you say that? We cleaned it, we let it dry for a year and a half, and then we put it back on the facade. Um, you couldn't do that every day. Um, the interesting part of this is that we used the topography to create uh, places for things to happen that we didn't necessarily plan. Volubilis welcomes a little bit less than half a million people every year. It's the one site that everybody knows in Morocco. Every student, every uh, school um, boy has been there. And we need to create those places in the shade. So it's extremely simple in the end what we did with this. It's, um, it's not a very inventive building. It's not innovative. It's not green. Uh, it's not big. Um, it's a... Uh, old questions with old answers. Um, I don't know, may not sound very exciting, but that really changed the way we do our job right now. Um, that's the view where, as you come back from the site and try to leave the area. Pardon. That's the view from the Roman side on the other side of the valley. And that's the an overview when you're on top of the, the highest part of the forum. Um, I show this uh, example because for people who've built uh, in our countries, um, these kind of details are extremely hard to do. Um, and we can only do them because we used exactly the same piece of wood for both the formwork and for the, uh, the, the facade and the menuiserie. Um, so in the end, the reason why I'm so grateful to be here, um, I don't know that it's the most representative of our work, but before and after is a different way for us to approach the project. Thank you.